Welcome, everybody. So good morning, good afternoon to all of you out there. Um, thank you for visiting. And reminder, just talked about this with Marilyn, that all of these videos are up on our YouTube channel. So if you go to alice.org and the how-tos, there's a link to the YouTube channel on the bottom. It's also the Alice Project on YouTube if you Google it. And we have a 2020 Zoom, so all of the previous ones are written there. With that, good morning, good afternoon, and let's go ahead and get started. This will be week four. This is our design lesson. So to find it, you can go to resources on our alice.org website, Alice 3 Lessons. That will bring you to this page. We're going to do this one right here, design process introduction. So jumping to that one, this is the page that we'll be going from. Again, the materials we'll be covering is the presentation and some of the things down here. I realized that I did not update the exercises and projects section to put the tutorial. So again, on the Alice 3 resources, it will be linked here in exercises and projects. I'll do that after this one. If you go to exercises and projects, there's the tutorials that we've been doing. Uh, we will be going over this one today. So if you wanted to have that ready, other than that, I'm going to jump into the presentation and it is the one entitled Design Process Introduction. All right, so one of the big things that has been a part of Alice's DNA from the beginning was that this is a very project-oriented platform. So the idea being that we want you to be creating your own projects um, and thinking about programming from the creative design thinking as well as the computational thinking process. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. This lesson can really be introduced um, as late as you'd like. We've only gone through the first couple lessons now for how to build a scene and the introduction to programming. You could put more of them in before this or learn more or circle back to this one later. This is sort of the earliest you could introduce it or start working on a project because you first need to know how to build a scene and do the basics of programming. But some of the things we're gonna cover in following weeks in terms of custom procedures, even some of the events and things like that could all be covered first. It would just give you sort of more tools in your toolkit when you uh, endeavor to start on this. So the big thing is when you drop into Alice, obviously it's, it's more of a toolkit. Uh, it's not a guided creation or puzzle-based learning environment. So a big question is just where do I start? This is that design thinking and problem solving process that we're talking about where if you look at this, and this is used in a lot of industries and things like that, there is sort of first step is to define what my problem is. The next step is to understand the problem, design a plan, implement the design, test, and then repeat. So if you were to add more arrows to this, which you probably should, you start a problem statement, go to understand the problem, and you go around the clock. The reason that there's lines going between is it's really, um, the idea that you can revisit any of the steps as needed and do incremental design. So if I test and realize that it's not what I wanted, I can go back to how I designed um, my program. So we're going to start first with the problem statement. And the problem statement seems kind of counterintuitive because we're doing something fun and creative. But really, it's just the idea that trying to come up with a very concise idea of what I want to do helps you with, you know, setting a goal and then achieving that goal. And an Alice problem statement is really in the creative realm. So when we talk about what is the creative problem we have, it's the idea that I wanna create a story where X happens. I wanna build a world where something happens. I wanna build a game where something happens. So these are our quote unquote problems, but they're more sort of artistic and creative problems. So understanding the problem is really saying, what am I making? This stage is intended to go sort of into um, how do I translate that problem statement into something that is more understood. So it could involve researching a story, observations that I want to put into my, my animation or game. Breaking this down into as small a pieces as possible helps you think about how you would address each of them. This is the introduction design lesson. So in this one, we talk very much about this first block, which is um, creating an animation. So storyboards, writing um, scripts, a you know short story, something like that is really the ways that we would think about the tools that we wanna use for understanding a, a narrative problem. 
we have another two lessons in design that we'll get to throughout these workshops so that you could circle to, which are for open world or interactive narratives and things like that. In those cases, we talk more about um, interaction mapping and some um, world maps and things like that, which aren't as necessary for this first lesson. And then when we talk about how do I understand a problem for a game, we get into the idea of game design documents. So what are win conditions and things like that. So back to the one that we're gonna start on introductions. And these are still relevant tools that you should go through even if you're gonna to jump to one of the later designs because they are still a component of a game design document or a world map and things like that because narrative is a huge part of games, a huge part of obviously interactive narratives or open world explorations and things like that still have these concepts underlying and use these tools for parts of what you would be creating. So what is an animation problem and how do I use a script and a storyboard to help me answer that? So understanding the problem, there's lots of great things out there as well in terms of creating interest curves and stuff like that. This is a very simple approach to understanding what is a story and dissecting a story and then creating these things. We definitely, if this is something that you're interested in, there's, there's lots of great things out there for going even deeper into this. This is obviously something we teach heavily at the Entertainment Technology Center. But I mean, the, the cores of a, a story are, where does the story take place? Who are the characters in the story? What actions happen in the story or what events happen? So thinking about your problem in terms of, do I understand that? One of the, the ways that obviously this is done in industry is to create a script. So this script, if you haven't done a bunch of script writing or read Shakespeare and things like that, is you know directions for either a play or a movie or something like that and looks something like on the left side. So in it, you have you know descriptions of the scene, you have movement directions, and then you have obviously dialogue or action cues and things like that. So it is, you know, unlike a novel or something like that, it is broken down into segments that are very much for what's gonna happen, which is what makes sort of a script over a story useful for Alice because it helps you dissect into exactly what's happening in any given scene. What is a storyboard? So a storyboard is just a set of visual elements that does the same kind of things. This is heavily leaned on for Alice and comes from the animation and film industry. Uh, each frame then captures something that is happening. Uh, where the story is taking place is sort of the things drawn into the background, who is in the scene, obviously if you see them in the frame, and then what is happening. I think a big thing when we talk about storyboards is that you know, much like comic books and graphic novels, things like that, uh, most of those action items happens in between the frames. So while you set up the scene in each frame, you know, the difference between frame one and two is that the lightning strikes. And so something had to happen in between those two frames to make that lightning happen. That was a artist rendition from our team. Um, it doesn't have to be that, that nicely drawn when I do storyboards and things like that. Um, stick figures work. I mean, really you're just trying to convey where things are and what's going on in the scene. So you don't have to be an artist to do storyboarding as just a layout mechanism. There's obviously usually on these, and we have some templates on our website where there's lines underneath it. So you can add whatever notes for things that might be happening, audio cues, things like that, descriptors that help you understand what's going on in the block. So one of the th reasons that we say maybe you want a storyboard, and again, a lot of it comes down to just what is your preference? Are you more of a written word person or a visual person? One of the things that is just helpful about a storyboard is that as we talked about in previous lessons, you have that camera because this is sort of a visual environment. So the, the square actually gives you the framing of the camera. It gives you some more visual information that might take a lot of writing in terms of what's going on in the background and things like that. So sometimes a storyboard can just be a faster way to iterate through understanding the problem. Once you have all of the design or the, the problem understood or some level of a script or things like that, uh, we need to design a plan. So this comes to the idea that you, know, you are going to come into the Alice environment, you're gonna do some scene setup and some programming. So what does that understanding translate into in terms of Alice? This really goes to the two lessons we already did. So when we're designing a plan for an animation or um, you know, short film, something like that, 
there's two different parts in, in big components. One is the set design. So what do I need to create in terms of the world in order to be able to do what I want, especially if you get into things where there's multiple different scenes, different camera angles, understanding all of those things and planning for it. So you set up your world to support what you're going to do is really important. The next part is I'm going to have to program this. So how can I dissect what I've created to give me a, a chance to start to lay out the program so that I don't start cobbling things together and find out that uh, I structured it in a way that made it more difficult or harder to blend together and things like that. So for set design, this is something where maps and diagrams are really helpful. So when we think about what we're gonna have to put into the scene, if you've written a script or you've done a storyboard, starting to just list out and understand the things that are in there. So we talk about this in terms of the script, it would be any of the scene descriptions. If it's a storyboard, what items are in there, including all of the sort of props in the background and characters that you have added to it. Remembering what we looked at in terms of the scene editor and sometimes it's good to revisit our gallery and things like that to sort of not set yourself up to unfortunately, creating something in your story that would be hard to build an Alice. That's just some of the limitations. We do have a import model option. There's ways to use billboards to customize things. So uh, a lot of things that are outside of our core gallery can be created. It just may take you longer. So think about the time and think about the importance of objects and things like that. So when we first came into the Alice, when you first load your world, you have the location theme that we choose from. So that's very much the high level of the where. In the gallery underneath is where you're gonna choose the characters for your story. And then of course we have lots of props and things like that. So first think about ones that will just add to the scene ambiance. And then more importantly, if you are gonna use props that are a part of your narrative, start to pull those things out and know where they are. And then the last one for scene design is those camera markers. So thinking about the directions of where you will want the angles of things to happen. To start laying out those things in terms of the spatial, and so what you are going to construct, this leans heavily again on sort of the game world and the theater world. So good examples of things that you could think about when drawing, and again, the top one is maybe a little more detailed than you necessarily need to be able to draw yourself. The bottom one maybe a little bit more so. So these are things of like a set design drawing. So think about it from the view of the audience, start to lay out what you want it to look like spatially. So in this one is a little bit up in a way so it's not as flat, you get a little bit of that depth. The bottom one is sort of the level design from game designer, things like that. So if you're going to have a map, especially as we move into things where you know, the camera may animate through that space and so you need to think about where it's gonna travel, what areas it's gonna go to, some other ones might just be where you jump to different scenes with different ones. But again, quick drawings of this to really think about how you're gonna set up your space because you don't wanna to start to build your whole world and then realize that you've, you've done it wrong for how you want your story to progress through and then have to go back and rebuild lots of elements. The next part is designing the plan for the program. So this is where we talk about algorithm design in computer programming and so it's just the idea of planning out your program and how it's going to work. So what is an algorithm? An algorithm is just a step of directions to accomplish a task. So this could be, you know, not in computer science, you know, what is my route from school and how do I write that out into a list of steps that I need to follow. In computer science, it's really what I need to do to tell the pro the computer to do what I want it to do. So an, an Alice algorithm is you know, because it's a program underneath, really a, a computer algorithm, um, but it's really your steps in terms of creating a story. So you see the one on the right, and this will be our example through this one. It is a joke. In this case, the do in orders is calling out that this is a step-by-step -step direction. So you can put directions in there for conditionals or do togethers and things like that. Step one, the scientist says, why was there thunder and lightning in the lab? Step two, lightning flashes. Step three, scientist two says, I don't know why. S step four, scientist one says, the scientists were brainstorming. So translating a story. If, if you wrote a story or used a script, the biggest way to start to dissect what your algorithm for the program is gonna be is you know, 
anything in this little write-up you see is blue. Those are nouns. So going back to, to English language learning or just language learning in general, nouns will be objects. Those are things that you should probably address in the scene setup and scenic design. Actions will be the verbs. And so those are in red. Those are the ones that are going to end up in your algorithm design is your programming because one is just, these are the objects. This is part of the scene creation. These are the verbs. These are the ones that I'm going to have to program. If I'm using a storyboard, I mean, same type of thing. If I see the object, the scientist sitting there, um, that is a noun. And so needs to be in the scene setup. Um, going back to the part where the storyboard, the verbs generally happen in between the scenes. So if the scientist was on the left side of the, the square in the first frame and the right side, then the verb is really to dissect those differences. So scientists moved, or in this case, um, clouds forms are the verbs that I would need to program. Scripted algorithm design is that example I just read to you and showed you. This is the text-based approach. So if I'm just writing it up, think about it as you know directions. You can do it text-based. Again, if you're somebody who is more of a writer or thinks through words, this is one option to just break it down. Um, continue to break it down into smaller sections until you really get to the point where it is a noun and a verb because going back to Alice or just those even directions for film and things like that, it is sort of object oriented. If you want something to happen, you're gonna be talking about animating an object in the space or adding an object and things like that. One of the challenges of doing text design though, you know, if this is how your brain works by all means, is that when we start to get into things where things happen at the same time, where things happen conditionally, or things repeat over and over again, this algorithm design that you see on the right side is some of the things you're gonna have to do. So there's do together, these two things should happen at the same time. Then we go back to do in order. This one should be done conditionally after something happens or potentially loop together. It can become a little bit more challenging for visually seeing that and then understanding what you're going to program though still a completely uh, valid way to approach this. One of the things that we think is great is using flowcharts. I mean, this is just something for program design in general because you end up with so many conditionals and things like that and um, the way that a program can run. Uh, flowchart, if you don't know what it is, is something that looks like on the left. They are a bunch of shapes that depict action inputs or processes it allows you to visually represent sort of loops going back, conditional branching and things like that. So it makes it a little easier to map out decision points or um, conditionals, things like that. Again, not gonna teach you all about flowcharts in a lot of ways. There's you know great materials out there, but essentially it is made up of these types of shapes, a rectangle for actions, uh, an oval for sort of the start and stop of a program, parallelograms, they all have sort of different things really, you know, make use of what you need. And then if you want to dive deeper into that, definitely look up flowcharts. There's a number of different types of flowcharts out there. And there's some great applications that are some of them free that will allow you to construct these so that you can do it. Um, but again, a piece of paper, a pencil, you can do a lot of this as well. Benefits of a flowchart for Alice is here's an example of things happening in a do together. It is really easy to say something will happen here, one of these bars across and you see the arrows going down. So you can see that these two actions happen at the same time as this action. A lot of times in Alice, you're gonna have multiple things animating at the same time or in your story and things like that. So it gives you a better visual representation of that. It is maybe a little bit easier to tweak and tune and, and drop down through. Then we get to the part where we've thought through our whole idea. So we started with the problem statement of what we wanted to create. So we wanted to create a story where we broke that story down into a scene design and we broke it into a script or something like that um, into an algorithm or a flow chart. And now it's time to implement our design. So when we talk about that, don't forget, and we are big proponents of commenting out first. Uh, the benefit of a flowchart or a algorithm design is that essentially those snippets that you wrote, if it is just what happens, so who does what or something that is said, uh, those could be the blocks of your comments. So adding those all in, in this case, you see the one that is 
the scientists joke. Um, we have another small module that maybe I can jump into today. We'll see how much time we have. That is just why to comment. What are some basic processes of commenting? So if you wanted to look at that, if you see first, there is the title scientist joke. Next is the author, Eric Brown. So these are things that if you want to comment your code more broadly is, you know, attribute your work in the beginning of your program. It won't actually run in your program, but obviously then anybody looking at this program will know who authored it, what it was for. When we get into things where we start creating um, other custom procedures where it will jump out a brief overview of why you created this and things like that. You see the scientist one, the lightning flashes. So all of the components of what was in that algorithm are represented in the comments. Incremental design, this goes back to the arrows went around and came to testing and going back. I mean, the idea that your story might change as you create it, you might do something and you want to check that it works before you write everything. I mean, that's really the intention of Alice. So one thing you could do is write the code for that little snippet under the comment and then press play, see if it works. You can always go back. Maybe it doesn't work because the program doesn't work. Maybe it doesn't work because you thought that that camera cut or that joke line or something like that was gonna be funnier than it was and you wanna revisit your story. So that can take you either back to understanding your problem, it can take you back to your, the design of it, or it could bring you back to implementation. So that arrow can really take you back to any of those steps depending on when you tested it, what you thought worked or didn't work. So that is the testing component. So implementing a small part, test it. And like I said, you can go back depending on you know, what your critique of your work might be. Again, Alice was originally designed to be something that could rapidly prototype. It's right why you can sort of compile your code and run it as often as quickly as you want. You don't have to spend time, a lot of time compiling it and then checking it. We made it as easy as possible. This is obviously something that most things do now. Um, so make use of that run button, check in on yourself. Again, reminder, save your world before you're running it. Running parts of it, another tip or trick would be, you know, here is the ability to fast forward a part of your code, uh, disable parts of your code. Just remember that if you have something where an object moves or something changes in a scene, if you disable that code and they don't move, it might impact later parts of your, your animation. So. Uh, only disable if it's something that's not going to impact the part of the program that you're trying to review. Tips and tricks. Just again, we, we <clears throat> harp on this a lot, but addressing parts of the whole, that can even be in the problem statement. Once you have your big idea, um, understanding and addressing the problem statement of, you know, scene one or act one, scene one, and breaking it down and continuing to break it down into smaller components so you can address, you know, different components of it. Separate scenes, uh, how you do this in Alice is a little bit challenging because we only have the one world. I mean, one option is that if you're just doing animated, you can video capture and stitch a bunch of different Alice worlds together into one final product. Uh, I'm gonna show you this. This is a good thing for us to demo and walk through together in terms of how to set up multiple scenes in the world. In this case, if you see that there's scene one over here and scene two over here, don't know how many of you watch sitcoms and things like that that are filmed in front of a live studio audience, but you know, Saturday Night Live, things like that. It will be that there is one scene on one side of the stage, one scene on the other. So when they jump to another one, it's not like the whole audience gets transported. It's just where you're looking. So you can set up one scene in one part of your Alice world, another scene, it's a completely different location, another part and jump the cameras to it. So I will do a demonstration of that one because it's really helpful. Again, when you're doing that set design, it's important to think about the fact that it is very much like a theater set or something like that, where we see what's in front of the camera, but we need to have things enter the camera scene, um, appear, disappear, things like that. Because of the nature of how Alice works, you will need to have those already in the world to be able to program them. So the tricks that we use and a lot of game industry and things like that use is that position them off to the side and bring them in. If it is something where somebody appears, um, you can do things where that happens in zero time so they can just jump into the scene. 
Another trick is to use transparency. So it can have zero transparency, meaning you can see through it and have it there. And then you can set it to one to either have it appear slowly or just appear quickly. Uh, just remember that when we get into conditional programming or mouse clicks, things like that, that even if it's transparent for purposes of collision or clicking on them and things like that, they do still exist in the scene. They're just not seen. Uh, a lot of times you can position things whack-a-mole style under the floor and have them move up so that they're already positioned where you want them to be, just down by some set amount. So it makes it easy for them to jump up and be where you want them to be. That is the gist of this one. I think it's easier for me to actually walk you through the exercises and projects part of this to show you how this plays out and to talk a little bit more of how you might want to approach it. Um, so let me shut this down and we're gonna go to exercises and projects. This is the one that's tutorial designing and animation. This one's a little bit different than our previous ones where we actually had a world for you to create because we want you to be creative about this yourself. This is your chance to build whatever you want in Alice. Again, we have the handouts and things like that if you're on it. So this is what it looks like. And it just talks again about all the things we just covered. So there's the introduction to animation design process, brainstorming. So one thing to think about is where are you gonna get inspiration for your animation. Uh, if you're doing this as a smaller one that you're going to revisit and you just want to make a shortcut or you're just not coming up with good ideas, a bunch of things that you know I looked at and obviously I apologize for the bad joke, but um, looking at jokes, looking at your favorite internet meme, think about a sentimental e-card that you saw. Obviously, because of storyboarding, comic strips and cartoons are a great source of this because you can animate to them. Uh, serious conversations or event. We have a lot of people who have made, you know, anti-bullying campaigns, things like that. So think about, you know, a an event that happened in your life or something like that. Uh, other ones would just be creating a music video is a great thing to inspire you. I mean, music videos are animated movies, um, and then obviously the audio is sort of there for your taking. Again, Creative Commons. I'm not telling you to go ahead and steal music and make something from it. Um, write your own song, but those types of things, you can take the narrative out of a song that you like and turn it into a story and make an animation. We are definitely into, in our world at the CMU's Entertainment Technology Center, and just in general, um, a part of this process would be that at that very beginning where you're taking that you know, design problem, the concise one of, you know, I wanna create a story where the dogs have to save their friend from the pound or something like that. Pitch that to your friends, find somebody to pitch your idea to. It's sort of the, the movie pitch room where use them as a sounding board to say, does this sound interesting? Get their feedback early. Getting feedback all through this process is really how this works in the real world and the creative world where I have to pitch my project to somebody to get a greenlit to become a movie. I then need to um, pitch each way along to figure out if it's going to keep getting funding and or move forward or just get buy-in from everybody who's working on it. So if we were doing this, and I'm going to go through this whole thing and we can discuss if you all want to make a go at this together, but in general, I don't know that we'll have enough time to stop each one. I would have you all do this and then pitch it to me. Um, if you have somebody in your house now, come up one of these, pitch them, uh, see if they like the idea and then sit down and write a longer script or draw a storyboard. So this is the understanding your problem. So take that pitch idea. And in this case, this is what you saw it in the presentation. This storyboard from my joke um, would look like. So I draw this up. Another great time to take that and show it to somebody because now somebody who maybe didn't get your concept or they got it, but they weren't really sure where it was gonna go. You've created something that has more information for them to respond to. So go ahead and share this out as well, because before you program it, it's way easier to erase something in the storyboard, add a new cell, change the order or something like that. Um, now on paper and drawing, then it's going to be once you've programmed and spent a whole bunch of time building the scene and things like that. Um, so again, another great time for, I think at each one of these, we sort of prompt you to go and find somebody and stand in front of them and give them the, the story pitch. 
Next up is the one that we talked about here again is the text version of the algorithm. So if you're a writer, this is what it might look like. Here is the uh, flowchart version of that same one. And you see that you know, we have taken the lightning as a noun, the fog is a noun, um, the lights are another one. So all of those things happen to create the, the effect of the lightning flashing. This one is more for you, so this isn't as pitchable of a moment, but it is a place where if you find that one of these boxes isn't very descriptive, it doesn't give you enough to know how you would program it, you can always draw another arrow from this and do another flow chart for one small part of it. So if this is the overall flow of your story, anytime you see one of the boxes and you're not sure how you would program it, break it out into smaller pieces. Now that you have that, uh, it's time to do the set design. Again, showed you some you know, theater ones where an architect may have drawn it, where it was very detailed. It doesn't need to be that. This would be the one that I drew for this one, where you know the layout is really this. I need some lab equipment in the background. I've got the two characters in the front. I'm going to have to make the lightning visible so it's transparent at the beginning, so I've put it in the scene already. These are my two camera positions. I start with a camera looking at both of them. I then zoom in to uh, one of the scientists. So with this, I could easily go into the Alice scene editor and be able to build what I see in this box. Building the scene. Again, this is the part where we just go and actualize my drawing. Here is the commenting. We looked at this before. We definitely want you to stop and write this out now. Go in and program the animation. You can see how the chunks of code sit under it. This is helpful for somebody coming in to try and help me figure out what's going wrong with my program. If I know that inside this block, this is what's supposed to happen. So in this case, the scientist's mouth moves and the say statement is, why was there thunder and lightning in the lab? Uh, it is easier for that. As your programs get bigger, it'll also be helpful to remind you what your code was supposed to do in there in case you want to change it. Uh, we have some nesting going on in there. I would then run the animation to see what it looks like. And if I didn't like it, I could keep going back around. Uh, I'm going to jump over and we will just open this project up so we can see the fruits of the labor. I hope I chose the one that actually has the code commented so I'm not showing you bad. Yep, this one's commented. So here's the code blocks inside of it. You can see that I could have broken this one down more into what does it mean lightning flash fluctuates and lights flash. So here is the you know, lightning flashes, the setting opacity. Um, to get the fog, we do this fog density. Um, to really make the lights flash, we set above light to yellow. These types of things, which you can see how it's been planned out. If I run the program, some things I might change would be to meet, leave those thought bubbles up a little longer. It's a little hard to read it. But so that is the gist of it. So following that one from the beginning to end, so the creation of this world is what that tutorial exercise is about. But it is really just to look to make sure that you make those stops along the way and you're intentional about your design because we think it'll help you in the long run save time. I've worked on countless entertainment projects where if you don't do enough of the design iteration and design projects um, that you find yourself lost in the middle, forgetting what kind of story or game you're trying to create. You don't know what the key components are. You program things in a way that doesn't make it easy for you to move them around and things like that. Um, so it is really important and it is done in industry to follow these things. So it might feel like busy work, but I assure you in the end, it is going to save you a lot of time to put it in now in order to be able to save yourself time later. Any questions there, or I will start a quick tutorial on how to do multiple scenes because I want you to feel like these first animations you start to create that you have the option to have different locations and just do another refresher on how to set things off the set and bring them in. All right, so I'm gonna start with a brand new set. So we'll go on the ground. 
I'm going to do a setup scene. So let's say that this is our first location. And so we're going to be on a grassy field, remembering the camera marker on the side. So I'm going to add a camera marker and I'm going to call this scene one earth so that I know what this camera is supposed to be. I'm going to go into the biped and we're going to add an alien because it'll be somewhat relevant to this one. So let's say we have an alien on the ground. Ooh, didn't mean to move that around. And so here is scene one alien on the ground. We have grass, we have a blue screen. Let's say I want to create a second scene. I can bring my camera back, I can rotate it to the side. I could put this really anywhere in the world, just remembering that you will see the things in the background. You can use billboards to create multiple spaces if you really need to block one from the other. But let's say that this is section two. Remembering that nobody's gonna know that it's not the same alien. I'm gonna put an alien over here. And let's say that this is the alien in space. And so we're gonna have an alien on earth and an alien in space. Let me add another camera marker that is scene two, and we'll call it moon. Well, obviously it doesn't really look like the moon, but remembering that we have the option to make the camera move, I'm actually gonna use a delay just so when we start this project, or start this, it doesn't immediately move. So we'll add a one second delay. Remembering that I can program the camera. So here is our camera and we are going to do move and orient to. So that's gonna take into account that shift. So remember that if I use the move to, we'll do this wrong from the start. Um, and I wanna do a scene to the moon. If I run this program, here's earth. Wait one second. Oh. Yeah, I forgot because they look exactly the same that in the scene setup, I need to move back to the first camera. So then when I now run my program, here's Earth. It moved to the other camera, but it didn't take in the rotation. So essentially I moved to the spot, but I didn't turn the camera. So remember that the orient to is the part that's going to get you the full information from that camera marker. So let's do this again, scene two moon. So here we are on Earth. Here we are on the moon, they look the same. So then what do I need to do to make scene two look different if I'm talking about environment effects? In this, this section, we have the set atmosphere, color, set fog density, these types of things. So let's say that we are going to set the atmosphere color as one thing because we need space. So here we are, if I run this program, now we wait the second we move, well, that's a little better. We still need to do a couple more things. So we also have ground. In ground, we have this set paint. This will give you all the options of those starter worlds again. So if I look at these, we have Mars, we have snow, we have all these types of things. I'm gonna choose the moon. Now, if I run this program, I come over here better, but in the real world, you can't pan from earth to the moon. And obviously the textures don't sort of swap like that. So this is a good moment where I would want to do something like a do together. So we would put the atmosphere and the setting the paint in here. We don't want it to slow fade. So we're going to set the duration to zero so that it just happens. And then we are going to want to put the camera move in there as well. Again, we can do the pan, but it's not, I mean, that is one way to have multiple scenes if you're just moving through the scene but you can't pan from left to right and go from earth to the moon. So we're all gonna so set this one to zero. So now we'll see that you know, we have those two scenes. Here I am on earth and I jump to the moon. So in the same broader, larger Alice world, I've got both of these setups as well. Um, any questions on that one? So again, if I sort of now look at the top view of my world, if I was drawing this out on a scene map, so a planning uh, scene setup, theater design sort of world map. I would draw this as scene one and I could add whatever I wanted to make Earth look like I want it with all the different characters. I would do the moon over here and I would probably just scribble some notes that says change ground texture and change sky color so that I get the moon over here. And I could continue to build these 
anywhere in the world that I wanted to, to create as many as that I wanted. This is one I use a lot. I mean, this seen some great worlds where a rocket will take off from here and end up on the moon. Things where you start on ground and then go underwater. So you switch to the, the sea floor and things like that. A bunch of different things that you can add to have multiple scenes in your world. Uh, the next component of this would just be, let's say that we're on the moon and remembering that, you know, we would want the search gallery do another alien. So his buddy is going to show up or we'll use a spaceship. Let's say that we want the spaceship to end up here. Uh, remembering that this is our camera view. Two options we can have is to set the opacity to zero. So if I don't want it until later in the story, if you set this one to zero, now if I run this program, that's what I'm gonna see and there's gonna be no UFO. I can then in the code say that after we're on the moon, I want that to show up. It does some teleportation, little nod to Star Trek. Um, here's the UFO. We have this one that is the set opacity. So we can set opacity to Bigger numbers don't matter, it's a scale of zero to one. Now when I run this program, I can add that object into the scene whenever I want, but it's not there when I first get there. That obviously happened a little bit quick. The other option is to come back to the scene setup, go to my second camera just so I can see it. Um, the UFO is there, let's bring the opacity back. I can use one shots. This is obviously a great way to make sure that I know exactly how far I moved it. So I'm gonna one shot this one, um, move down, because I'm gonna hide it under the floor so that if I had a mouse click that depended on something happening on clicking the UFO, I don't accidentally trigger it. So we'll move it down to, oh, not enough. So I'm gonna undo that because it didn't make it through the floor. I'm gonna move down. Well, we'll just do 10. It is definitely out of the scene now. I can scribble a little note to myself or in that scene setup, have UFO located 10 below floor, something like that. Now, when I go to my scene, I can do essentially the same thing where I do UFO move up. We'll do 10 and I don't want it to actually come through the floor. I just want it to appear so I can set the duration to zero. Now, when I run the world, you, know, you see that one pop into the scene. So those are multiple different ways you can do it. One is to position it off screen. One is to set the transparency of zero and bring it up to full. Um, think about those. Remember that in that scene design, you're going to want to place those objects where you're going to want them and then go in and you can, you know, obviously on scene setup as I did, set the transparency to zero. Use the moves to set them exactly where you want relative to where you're going to use them in the world. Um, so those are really helpful when you start to think about longer stories or stories that have multiple locations. So wanted to show that one now because I think it's really helpful at this point as some tips and tricks. Well, this one wasn't so much about teaching you how to do things in Alice. It was more about teaching you how to think about using Alice. So I hope that sets you up to go off and create your own world. Um, by all means, we would love it if you share your creation with us. You can do it through, you know, tweet at us, hashtag program with Alice. Um, send us an email with your file. Uh, we have a bunch of other things that we have going. Uh, there is a how-to now on our website that is how to share your worlds. So let me actually share one more time because we want you to do this with us. All right, if I am on Alice, go to Alice 3 How To's. We have an export video in there. It is just not as functional as it used to be. So scrolling down our Alice 3 How To's, you will see some audio ones. Audio is a great thing to add to worlds. Let me circle back on that um, because I wanna show you a world and just how much these How To's can help you make your animation so much better. It uses all the things you've already learned in Alice. Um, we have sharing. So recording and sharing in Alice World, if you're just doing an animation, you can capture it using OBS. It's free software. We give you all the how-tos to do that here. 
um, that is a great way to capture, especially if you're going to stitch multiple Alice creations together. So you just created separate worlds and want to make it into one video. This is a great way to capture your video in good definition and then stitch together a bigger project. We also now have the ability to make an Alice app, a standalone app. So our new player will allow you to take the world that you export and run it directly from. Here's Underwater Explorer. This is one of the worlds that I've used as the example for that. You can see that it has its own icon, its own application, and it will just launch directly into your world. So this would be a way for you to take whatever you create in Alice and really create your own standalone app, share it with friends, send it out, put it on a website, those types of things. So you can see my world here. This one here is Sea Encounter. I will add my own talking points to it. Um, in this one, there's a background audio of, you know, a sea shanty, there's waves crashing. It's a little bit of a choppy play. Added audio for the footsteps that makes it a lot more rich. Um, my internet is not going to support doing everything we're doing. I highly recommend going ahead and checking out this video to see just how adding some simple audio exists. Um, we also have some added audio library items that he made for us that can be great to add to your world. This one links over to all of those how to's or it should, I guess it doesn't. Uh, so let me go back to resources. Alice three audio library will bring you to a place to download these expansion packs of audio libraries. It'll take you to an audacity website where there's a bunch of free sounds that you can use. Um, here are all the different how-tos that we have for adding audio to a world. Check these out. It really does make a super simple world feel way more interesting. It talks to you about how to do voiceovers. Um, so let me go back. Creating custom audio in Audacity. This is one where we've done a bunch of worlds. I mean, speech bubbles are great, um, but even better is, you know, getting your friend who has a great voice to be the voice of the alien or something like that um, can just make it more interesting and take away those sort of two dimensional uh, thought bubbles and speech bubbles that sort of take away from the dimensionality of the world and things like that. So check these out and use these um, because they are a super simple way to just add a whole new level to your Alice world. With that, I will stop sharing. Uh, can Thank you, you all. Uh, oh. yeah, can you use, um... Uh, what is it called? Um, WavePad instead of Audacity? You can use whatever free ones that you want. I mean, essentially in that how-to, we talk about the file format that you need for it to come into Alice. We support I think MP3s and Wave. Um, but so look at that one. If you're having a challenge uh, importing your audio file, I think there's also information on that that will tell you how to do it or how to at least change the file format. So we will support a bunch of those. Um, okay, I have another question. Um, there used to be a fifth button on the um, scene, in the um, scene editor that would allow you to copy. Supposing I wanted to copy like the source and the uh, teacup in the saucer. All right, so if I have a character, sorry, it seems my computer is about to give up on life. I have too many things running. All right, so here's Alice. Mm -hmm. uh, I will, we have not had anything here. It is the option click, no. Control click. It was Alt click. Yeah, so on a Mac it is Control click. I think on PC it's Alt, and you'll see that it pulls another bounding box over. So that is how I can copy and create replicates. You still obviously have to name it and instantiate it like another object. Mm -hmm. So you can do that. Um, if I do that and I create something that has you know multiple objects that I want to clone, like a tea teacup on a tea platter or something like that. Um, here's one thing you can do. We haven't talked about vehicling yet. I will get to that in another how-to. I can set the vehicle of this Alice to the other Alice. 
it just means that now if I move other Alice around, she is going to follow. So it's the essentially like grouping in a lot of other applications, but we'll go a little bit more into what it really means. Um, okay, I don't see the, uh, how did you set the thing? Oh, uh, huh? actually this is on our new feature list would be to have those clone together. It was one of our artists who put lots of apples oh, on a tree. The, where it says like vehicle, that. okay. So that will help you move multiple objects. That's another helpful tip and trick. Just remember if you're doing that, just to move part of a scene to come back. And if you don't want that to be the functionality where every time one of them moves, the other one moves, mm -hmm. you're going to want to set this back to this, which means that it's now vehicle to nothing. So you don't have to do it as an array or something like that. Well, even if I made it into an array, it wouldn't move in the scene editor together. They will be a part of the same array, but they're not going to functionally move when I drag them around the scene. With that, I will wrap this one up. So thank you again for joining us. I hope this was helpful. Share your worlds with us in all the ways that I just showed you with either capture a video or create your own app out of it. Send it to our uh, Twitter, Facebook, or directly to us on our contact form. We'd love to take a look at it and put it on our site. Um, thank you for joining us. Look for the previous week's workshops up on our YouTube channel, as well as this one will be up in a couple of days. Uh, join us next week, or if it's already next week, check out next week's one. We're going to do custom procedures. It is just a great way to make your programming and animation life easy by creating and then sharing multiple things within one. So thank you again for joining us and we'll see you next week.